Galatians 4, verse 12, and I will start from reading verse 12 through 19 to kick us off today. And Paul opens and says, Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. And we'll end that there. But to start in looking at verse 12, this is really a verse of desperation. Paul is crying out to the Galatians in desperation. He uses the the word diomai, the, the verb for entreat, which is to implore or to beg or to beseech. This is a man who's not afraid of losing his pride here. This is a man who is humble, even willing to humiliate himself to the point of begging. He's begging the Galatians. He's pleading with them to become like he is. And here what he's talking about is to be as a Gentile. Not in terms of being unsaved, but in terms of not subjecting himself to the strict observance of the law. He's made himself a Gentile when he was ministering to them initially and when he's ministering to them now so that he may effectively minister to them and all. He didn't approach them initially while wearing a prayer shawl and tassels. He didn't come to the Galatians abiding by Judaistic regulations in their presence. And he did not come to them demanding circumcision. And when he arrived, he didn't set up a temple He didn't start performing animal sacrifices in their presence. He didn't come to them proclaiming all of the laws and all of the customs that they had to follow, and nor did he come to them strictly observing those things himself. And because this is something that's important, because could you imagine what would have occurred if he did do those things? That if he did come to the Galatians, this rather Gentile population, and he come to them like that, He showed up as some holier-than-thou man clothed in these priestly or academic garbs. He was carrying a giant two-ton scroll on his back. And he shows up and he just unrolls the scroll and snaps his fingers and he starts directing a couple of people to pick out animals and then directs another to start setting up an altar for sacrifices. And then while they do that, he He's yelling and he says, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was resurrected. He was the Messiah. He was the son of the living God of whom the Abrahamic promise prophesied. And I also bring with me this book that contains all the laws you must follow in order to be saved by his death. Gather around and let's start in this first paragraph here. And I hope you brought something to write with, because this will be a lot for you to remember. Well, wait. None of you have any unclean diseases, right? Okay, well, never mind. I'll, come, I'll, ju- I'll raise my voice. You stay where you are, and I will just I'll yell a little louder so you can hear me. Right? He didn't do this nonsense. He didn't do these kinds of things. He came to the Galatians preaching that Christ and Christ alone was, sal- was sufficient for salvation. He came to them as a Jew who had come to the realization of the sufficiency of grace and of the sufficiency of Christ. He grappled with that difficult philosophy himself before he ever had to present it to these Galatians, and he was able to do so effectively. And so he did not attempt to force this law upon him. He didn't force these customs on them. And this brings to mind his words, in 1 Corinthians 9.19. And this text 
and I'll read it all the same, but listen to the words of what, what he says here. In verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 9, he says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. And then to those outside the law I became as one outside the law, Not being outside the law of God, but rather under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. And to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. And... And I love this text in 1 Corinthians 9 because he's very careful to add those parenthetical phrases. He's very careful to say, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, but not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. He still adds these qualifiers to make sure people aren't getting confused and aren't getting thrown off by what he's saying. But Paul has the freedom to observe the law or not to observe the law. And here he advises that he chooses not to observe the law when ministering to Gentiles, but that he does observe it when ministering to Jews. And he's clear that the reason he does this is because he doesn't want to add unnecessary burdens to the people whom he is evangelizing. This is why he had Timothy circumcised, because Timothy, his mother, was a Jew. And so he, and Timothy was going to accompany Paul frequently on his missionary journeys. And as we know, the first people group Paul always evangelized was the Jews. He always went to the synagogues first. And he would only start preaching to the Gentiles when the Jews got mad and started beating him or imprisoning him. That was his sign to go. But he circumcised Timothy because an uncircumcised Jewish believer would certainly be a stumbling block to the Jews they would be ministering to. But Titus... Another of Paul's disciples was not encouraged to be circumcised, and that's because presumably Titus was not as frequent a traveling companion to Paul as Timothy was. And then also, because Titus ends up being the pastor of a church that is predominantly of a Gentile population. So these are good examples of Paul's approach to evangelism. He doesn't want to trouble the people he is evangelizing any more than he has to. And we may be familiar with the quote of Spurgeon, which goes, the gospel has enough offense of its own. May we be careful not to add any of our own to it. And so the context of the quote, of course, is different from the Galatians context, but but the principle is all the same. The concept is all the same. Don't ask of people what God does not ask of them. The gospel is a hard, hard truth. Do not burden them with weights God has not burdened them with. As such, don't ask that someone embrace our culture or embrace our mannerisms or embrace even our personalities to be saved. Those are unnecessary burdens that can backfire very quickly and can even dissuade people altogether from believing the gospel. So focus on the gospel because the gospel is hard enough to believe and that's where the true battle and the true war lies. And that's what Paul is getting at. And so as we see in verse 12 in Galatians 4, it's just confirmation of Paul's evangelistic approach. Paul's being consistent with what he said in 1 Corinthians 9. He's being consistent with his actions for when he encouraged the circumcision of Timothy and not of Titus. He became a Gentile here so he could minister to the Gentiles. And now he begs these Galatians to be like Gentile again. Not in the sense of the unbeliever, but in the sense of not trusting in these ceremonial laws for salvation. And at the end of verse 12, he adds a curious little statement saying that you did me no wrong. And one way that we can look at this is from the spiritual perspective as well. Because in other words, it's like Paul is saying, if I had to abstain 
from ceremonial laws in order to evangelize you. And these ceremonial laws are what sanctified me or what provided me salvation. Then evangelizing you would have been spiritually harmful to me. I would have needed to live a life of sin just to get you to believe the gospel. That's ludicrous. I didn't sin by ministering to you. I didn't sin by not observing the Jewish customs in your presence. And I didn't sin by not placing upon you the weight of the ceremonial laws. You all didn't make me stumble by not observing these laws. And you did me no harm. I voluntarily lived like a Gentile because I had the freedom to do so. And I had the freedom to do so because my salvation is in Christ Jesus. And so it is no longer a necessity that I observe the Mosaic customs, but is instead a choice. And I plead with you to become like that as well. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And so be free. But then as we approach verse 13, we, we see a slight, somewhat, a slight change of subject. Because Paul now begins talking about his early encounter in ministry with the Galatians. And so in verse 13, he says, You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And then verse 14, And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So the sudden structure here implies that the reason Paul preached to the Galatians in the first place is because he had some kind of bodily ailment. In other words, had it not been for this bodily ailment of Paul's, then theoretically, the Galatians never would have had Paul preach to them. And then the letter of Galatians never would have been written. And so that's a huge, huge providence of God. Because had it not been for Paul's ailment, then there's a big possibility we might not be studying this epistle this morning. And we would, of course, not be reaping all of the spiritual benefits it has to, off to offer. And then you also think of the, the tremendous impact it had on the Reformation as well. So it's a, a huge ripple effect that God's providence has. And there is no end to his wisdom and there is no end to his knowledge. But even, even still, I think this is just good encouragement to show us that God always works in weaknesses and infirmities, and there is always something going on behind the scenes that we know nothing about. Nope. But, as, but as far as the actual ailment um, that Paul experienced, he doesn't say, and, and maybe he broke his foot or sprained his ankle while traveling, Maybe he got attacked by a wild animal or got a disease or an illness like the flu. Um, in, in the Greek, this, this literally reads weakness of the flesh. So even in the Greek, it's pretty broad. It, it doesn't really give us a lot of specifics. Um, so it's, it's general language, and he likely doesn't give specifics about what the ailment is because the Galatians already know what it was. As in, it's just basically the equivalent of us saying, I was sick or I wasn't feeling well. And so he didn't have to explain it because they were already familiar with it. And I think naturally our minds might wander to the thorn in Paul's flesh that he talks about in 2 Corinthians 12. Um, and about the thorn, he says, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. And yet, because we don't have specifics in that chapter or in our Galatians chapter about what it is, we can't really compare those two with full confidence. Um, but he does reference this thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians, and he does reference this kind of weakness of the flesh in, in Galatians. Um, but for, 2 Corinthians was written around 56 AD, and Galatians was written around 48 AD. So it was written roughly 10 years earlier than he mentions the thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians. Um, and so in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul also tells us that he was regenerated 14 years prior uh, to writing that letter. And so what this means is that some people have taken this to mean that 
Paul received his thorn in his flesh close to his conversion date, shortly after he was regenerated on the Damascus Road. Um, But if his thorn in the flesh were this bodily ailment in Galatians 4, that probably tells us that it's chronic, that it's something that he's had for a decade by the time we get to 2 Corinthians 12. Um, But clearly it doesn't consistently prevent travel. Um, It doesn't prevent him from being able to minister. And so perhaps it has flare-ups from time to time. And Paul stopping in Galatia may have just been a result of this flare-up or whatever it is, be it a physical ailment or a spiritual ailment of some kind. But, of course, many suggestions have been proposed. None of them really matter. Um, But there are many different propositions that people have thrown out there. Um, Some have gone so far as to say that Paul had malaria, and so the reason he went to Galatia in the first place because of this illness is because higher altitudes um, are able to suppress the symptoms of malaria and the risk of of, uh, malaria, and Galatia is pretty high above sea level, so the thought is that he went to Galatia to lessen those symptoms. Um, Others have suggested epilepsy, um, ophthalmia, eye inflammation, and so on. Um, Don't ask me why, but those are the suggestions that have been thrown out there throughout the ages. But no matter what the ailment is, the type of ailment, of course, is irrelevant, Um, but no matter what it was, it made Paul stop in Galatia regardless, and the Galatians took care of Paul while he suffered through this. And Paul describes that the Galatians took care of him so well that they treated him as if he were an angel of God or even as Christ Jesus. And so this is extremely good Christian hospitality. And you'd have to think that if this occurred here in in the South, in in Texas, you'd have to think of what this would look like. That if they invited, uh, that if the Galatians came to our church, they would have probably turned on the air conditioning offered him some coffee, some sweet tea, started making him some dinner while caring to his wounds and even using their own money and resources to take care of him. And then during that time, Paul just began speaking the gospel, teaching them the things of Christ. And it was also during that time that he was, as a Gentile, he wasn't, he wasn't imposing the Judaistic regulations upon them. And, and I think, too, that this even still goes to show the, the humility of Paul. Because if, if he were still an incredibly proud Pharisee, I'm not sure if he would have ever even let these Gentiles take care of him like this. Or even be that close to him in proximity and have that kind of rapport and have that kind of relationship to him. He probably would have been too proud to even stop in that kind of city and to even let himself be taken care of by Gentiles like this. But regardless, he didn't, and he still proclaimed to them the gospel. And Paul states that the Galatians showed him no scorn, that they were not rude to him. They were not insulting. And so on the contrary, these people were warm and welcoming, and they were hospitable. And they were gracious. And I think that should make us wonder when we read this, can the same be said of us? Were a man or a woman with an illness to knock on our door, seeking shelter and food and drink and medical treatment, and yes, with no health insurance, would we help them? If the Apostle Paul knocked on the doors of Faith Baptist and we had no idea he was an apostle, would he have received the same treatment from us that he would have received from the Galatians? Would he have said of us that we treated him like an angel? What if we take the church out of the equation? And what if someone just seeking these things just knocks on the door of our house? Would we show them that kind of hospitality? And I think that hospitality is an often neglected Christian virtue, if we want to call it a virtue. It's it's one that I think is not thought of often, and yet it's in the scripture all the same. 
I think one that jumps out to us, I think naturally, would be Hebrews 13.2, when the writer says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Our minds can also drift to Leviticus 19, where God is commanding the Israelites about, their, about basically the, the, how to deal with foreigners, and he says that they shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. As in, don't let a person's background, don't let their national origin, don't let their race, don't let X, Y, and Z determine how you treat them. Treat them as you would your brother. Treat them as you would your neighbor. Treat them as you would your own family member. That was Leviticus 19. That was before the New Testament. Right. It is a virtue. It's certainly a, a principle. And an attribute of an elder, of a presbyteros, as described in 1 Timothy 3.2, is that he must be hospitable. So even a command and a requirement of a church leader is that he has to be hospitable. So hospitality is not just a nice thing for a Christian to have. Rather, it is a requirement It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. It is a requirement of Christian conduct. It is something that God commands of us. We are to love strangers. We are to take care of the sick. We are to take care of the poor. We are to take care of the needy. And whether we know them or not is irrelevant. And the Galatians, despite their newness in Christ, or perhaps even despite them not knowing Christ, they at least got that right. They at least performed the basic fundamentals of the faith, which is loving one another, which is loving and taking care of strangers and loving and taking care of those who are in need. And as a matter of fact, in verse 15, later on in the chapter, Paul says, what has become of this blessedness? Referring referring to the Galatians as blessed because of their willingness to help others and for their hospitality. And so contrast that statement in verse 15 of what has become of this blessedness with the remarks he's been making throughout this epistle, even at the beginning of this epistle. Because remember in Galatians 1.6, Paul says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Galatians 3.1, he says, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And then verse 3 of chapter 4, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? And then what we just read in verse 11, when he said he was afraid that he's been laboring, laboring over them in vain. So contrast all of those statements with his statement in verse 15, or his question in verse 15 of what has become of this blessedness. There's a night and day difference, almost, in their behavior. And it's a night and day difference both in the Galatians' theology, yes, but also in how they were treating Paul, and also in their disposition. For Paul, they, they'd forsaken the true gospel and they, they were now treating Paul or envisioning him as if he were some kind of enemy. And we can make the argument that their behavior towards Paul changed because their disposition towards the gospel changed. And that's what Paul's getting at in verse 16 in our next verse. Because he asks them, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? So that friendship that companionship and that fellowship and love that Paul and the Galatians used to enjoy was now severed because of the gospel. Someone had come right behind Paul. All of that teaching and preaching and laboring and guiding that Paul had done, and they misled the Galatians. They came up right behind him, and they started undoing what he had done. And maybe some in this room, maybe some of you can imagine this. Maybe some of you can empathize with this kind 
of situation. And my, I think my mind wanders instinctually to, to parents who <laughs> devote their lives teaching and training their children in Christ. But then, of course, inevitably, they, the children move outside of the home and they go off to college or in the workforce and then they allow themselves to be swayed from that Christian upbringing and from that Christian conduct. Maybe you've had family members, perhaps, you once enjoyed godly fellowship with. But as years progressed and as years went by, those family members began to slip further away from Christ and their beliefs changed and warped until they started to despise Christianity. And because they know that you're a Christian, that relationship that you had with them has now drastically changed. It's now been warped. It's now different. You're not near as close as you used to be, maybe even slightly hostile. And those of you who've been in those, these, under, uh, these situations, you can understand the kind of pain that Paul is feeling here. Because it's not merely the pain of a pastor or a teacher losing someone of his flock. Certainly it is that. But it's also the pain of a Christian brother losing the relationship with his Christian brother or sister. Yeah, there we go. Hostile. Mm -hmm. That's the natural. That's not a. That's not a spiritual reaction. That's a fleshly, a worldly yep. reaction. Uh, as long as you're telling me what I want to hear, that's fine. We can maintain that friendship. But once you tell me something that I don't want to hear, even though it is the truth, then that's changes that. that and, and those of us in this room that have had adult children that have turned away from. The, the, the darkness hates the light. The flesh naturally hates the things that are of Christ. And, um, and even Jesus, I didn't come to, I came to bring a sword, yeah. not peace. And I think that's why the scripture always admonishes us to speak, even when we speak these things, to speak with grace. Yes. Our speech should always be seasoned with grace. So when we speak these things, we've got to be very careful. Yep. No, I mean, it brings us back to the quote, the gospel has enough offense of its own. Yes. Yes. And that's a, a key thing to remember in any evangelistic context that it, I think it's natural too. I mean, we will get angry sometimes because we get frustrated. You can even tell the anger in Paul's tone in, in, uh, in this epistle. Um, we can get angry and that, that's okay, but we still have to temper that, like exactly like you're saying. We still have to be gentle. We still have to make sure that we're not offending them any more than the gospel does. Right. In the early part, he's very bold. Yes. <laughs> and then by this part, I'm back to the side. Okay, I need to calm down. Yep. So. For sure. And, and so this is, the, this is the kind of pain, though, that, that he's in, because um, you, you think, too, that while pastorship certainly involves shepherding the pastor is still part of the same that same spiritual family and that same flock and, and naturally friendships and relationships are formed and so what paul is feeling here it's a it's a tricky and bitter almost dirty kind of pain as in it's it's a pain that's parental sure but also relational and that's why paul is so sorrowful and so disappointed because he's upset because it's as if all his labor is in vain, and all of these friendships and com uh, all these friends and companions whom he dearly loved and have has been with are now treating him like an enemy. They're now treating him as if he's lied to them and as if he's out to out to get them. And so that's an awful experience. This has to have been for Paul, and how sad he really must have been. 
And he expresses this sorrow in verse 19, a couple verses down, when he says, I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And notice the word again. So it's like, I'm going back to the beginning, like when I was first evangelizing you, when I first were wanting Christ to be formed in you. It's as if we have to start all over. I'm again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. But now let's move to verse 17. And in this verse, Paul states, speaking of the Judaizers in in the third person here, he says, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. And this phrase is important. Um, the, the phrase, they make much of you, comes out of a single word in the Greek text, and it's just the word zealousin, which you can probably guess, it means to be zealous. And the, the Judaizers, they were jealous for the Galatians. They were zealous for them. They were making much of them. And so you can picture how this scene might have played out. It's probably borderline flattery. If not flattery all together. The false teachers were probably encouraging the congregations, maybe uplifting them and praising them, saying things like, you're so wise, wow, you're so smart, so godly. You're so successful or talented or gifted. Perhaps they were helping them with any kind of needs that they had, maybe financial needs, maybe physical needs. And it's likely that they were even befriending them. They were forming those deep connections with the Galatians, uh, with the Gentiles at least, Gentile Galatians. And, And so they were essentially flattering them. They were trying to win them over. They were forming those relationships. They were encouraging them. But Paul says they were doing this for no good purpose in verse 17. He says that they're doing this so that they may be, that they may be mu- made much of instead. And so in other words, the false teachers were wanting the Galatians to see them as allies and as friends because what kind of ally would want to hurt you? What kind of friend would want to injure you? If the Galatians trusted these false teachers, or viewed them as friends, then they'd be much more susceptible or more willing to accept the doctrine that they're teaching. But that's what false teachers do, isn't it? Nothing's changed. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you've met a rude Jehovah's Witness? Or a rude Mormon? I mean, perhaps you have, But the ones that I always observe, at least, are always extraordinarily kind. Extraordinarily kind. Think about the false teachers we see on TV. Even just think about Joel Osteen, for example. Presents himself as probably one of the nicest people on the face of this planet. I mean, he's a walking toothpaste commercial. Like, every word he says is through grinning, smiling teeth. In all the people, I think that, at least personally too, that I have experienced with, all the people who are in the emergent church and charismatic church and Pentecostal churches that I've been to and talked with, they've all been some of the nicest, most warm-hearted people I have ever met in my life. Incredibly hospitable, incredibly caring, incredibly gentle and loving, And yet, they're part of churches that preach numerous false doctrines. Why are false teachers always so nice? Why are they always so kind? And you have to listen really closely here. It's because Satan is nice. Not nice in a godly way. Nice in a social way. Socially speaking, Satan is extremely nice. He is extremely kind. Think about it. So go back to the garden with Adam and Eve. When he slithered up to them, was he mean? Was he just calling them names? Was he like, hey, you two bozos, 
You two have the ugliest bodies I have ever seen in my entire life. You have got to cover yourselves up. Here, eat this fruit. No. He was subtle. He was alluring. He told them that if they ate the fruit, they could be like God. He made it seem as if he were their ally, not their enemy. He made them think that he would bless them and not curse them. He kind of made it seem to be as if God were the bad guy. He was like, oh, no, he doesn't want you to eat that. He doesn't want you to be like him. But see, I like you. I want you to be blessed by this. I'm your friend. So I want you to eat this because I want you to enjoy yourself and to have a good life. But then even think about how we talk to Jesus when he tried to tempt him. I always like this story because it, I think it just shows us so much about Satan and how he interacts and what his nature is like. Because he, he's face to face literally with the Son of God, who is his biggest enemy in all of, not creation, but all of just everything, in all of reality. He is the biggest enemy. And here he is face to face with his biggest enemy. And is Satan rude to him? I mean, not really. He's actually kind of respectful. He even offered Jesus stuff. He was nice. He was respectful. He wanted to make Jesus feel like he would bless him and not curse him. But he had an ulterior motive, of course. Satan wanted Jesus to fall so Satan could elevate his own status. And false teachers are all about elevating themselves. They consistently praise their congregation. They never correct their congregation because they're so desperate for the congregation's approval. They don't want to lose any church members. They want to keep their church members happy so they'll continue to come in droves and, of course, continue to tithe and give gifts. They'll tickle their ears, telling them what they want to hear, telling them false doctrines. But, of course, it's not for the congregation's benefit. At the end of the day, it's all for the benefit of the pastor. And that's why you've got false teachers who have multi-million dollar private jets, while their congregation has members who are financially impoverished. But what do these false teachers teach? Give me money. God will bless you. Give to the church. Give me gifts. God will bless your life. He'll bless your marriage. He'll bless your bank account. He'll bless your children. They, and they hit it hard. They, they always talk about the thing that you care most about. Do you care most about your marriage? Oh, well, give me money. God will bless that. Do you care about your children? Well, give me money. God will bless them. Do you want to be cured of this disability or of this ailment? Well, give me money. God will fix that too. But think of just false religions in general. They do the same thing. Do X, Y, and Z, and you'll achieve enlightenment. Do X, Y, and Z, and you'll die and spend eternity with thousands of virgins. Do X, Y, and Z, you name it, you'll get it. Do X, Y, and Z, you'll get money, enlightenment, kingdom, salvation, sex, planets, the like. What is that? That's legalism. That's all it is. Every religion teaches it. Doing something in exchange for God's blessing. Doing something in exchange for some kind of blessing or physical or spiritual prosperity. That's what the Judaizers were doing. Same thing, just different form of it. False teachers never change. And we see that here in Galatians. They're doing the same exact thing, same exact strategy, same exact tactic. They're being nice. They're using that good foot-in-the-door tactic. They're trying to get them on their side. Then they're going to feed them a lot of worthless garbage. And so they never change. What they have to offer is just as worthless as it was thousands of years ago when Satan, the first false teacher, offered something. And the way they go about selling you that worthlessness is the same as well. And the reason false teachers never change is because their father never changes. Satan never changes. 
He's just as crafty and sneaky as he was in the garden, and the Judaizers and Galatians are proof of how false teachers have taken after Satan for centuries, and they always will. And yeah, and that's what Paul's getting at as well, that they want to be made much of. And so as we pivot now to verses 18 and 19, Paul says it's good to be made much of for good purposes, meaning that someone being nice to you is only good if they genuinely have your good in mind and have no ulterior motive, of course. But then as I touched on earlier in verse 19, Paul makes a remarkable statement that he is in the anguish of childbirth until they come to their senses and until they turn from these evil legalistic doctrines. And obviously Paul does not know what childbirth feels like, but it's as if he's saying, I don't know what childbirth feels like, but my pain and sorrow over your waywardness is so great that it's comparable. And of course every mother in this room is shaking their head. But, of course, it's just hyperbolic language. And it gives us a window at the kind of sorrow that Paul has. He's making a point. And significantly, we know this is genuine sorrow. Because, again, Paul doesn't get a physical benefit out of this. He's not getting money here. He's not getting fame. He's not getting praise. Rather, he gets the opposite of these things. He's putting his life in jeopardy numerous times. He's using his own resources. He's using his own time. He's expending himself in multiple different ways in order to benefit these Galatians. And he really gets no physical thing out of it. And so we know in verse 19 when he's saying it's as if he's in the anguish of childbirth until they come to their senses, we know that this is genuine. We know that he truly means this because he literally gets no kind of benefit from this. And so he genuinely loves this congregation, and he desperately desires their salvation. And we could put this in human terms, I think, by um, maybe comparing this to the love of parents and their children. Generally, parents get no physical benefit out of wanting what is best for their children, or wanting what is, uh, or wanting their children to be healthy and safe and happy and taken care of. But parents want what is best for their children because they genuinely love them. And that's the same of what Paul is doing here. He gets no physical benefit from this, and yet he still wants what is best for them spiritually. And so there's really two lessons I think we can get out of this in total here. I think this ought to be a lesson for those in the ministry and for those desiring to go into the ministry. Because this is also a lesson for those seeking a church and seeking a pastor, and it's a lesson both for the pastor who is too lenient and for the pastor who is too demanding. Because for the one who is too lenient, he may think that it is love that stays his hand, and that it is love that prevents him from ever correcting his congregation, or calling them to repentance, or calling them to believe on Christ, calling them out of sin. He doesn't want them to be sad or to cause any conflict. He just wants everyone to be happy. So he never says anything offensive, and he never bothers to correct his church's behavior. But in Galatians, Paul doesn't do that. Paul loves his congregation enough to correct them. He loves his congregation enough to be kind of harsh with them. He loves his congregation enough to be blunt with them and to call them to repentance and to tell them that they are in error. It's not love that stays the hand of discipline. Instead, it's weakness. And may I dare say that sometimes it could even be cowardice, maybe, maybe even hatred. Spare the rod, spoil the child, right? But for the pastor who is too demanding, too fiery, who is too harsh with his flock, there is also a lesson here. Paul was harsh with the Galatians, yes, but quite infrequently. 
There are only a few verses in this entire epistle in which Paul was genuinely harsh. A few verses out of many. And remember, Calvin didn't think he went far enough. The majority of the passages in this book is Paul sharing the gospel with them. It's him sharing truth with them, calling them to repentance. And you also have Paul expressing how he feels about his flock. He's saying that he's sorrowful. He's saying that he loves them. He's saying that he's in the anguish of childbirth for them. So he's harsh with them, yeah, but he tempers that harshness with love. And he tempers that with gentleness. And he tempers that with kindness. And it's the same way that you put an ice pack on a burn to reduce swelling. I mean, it's the same kind of principle. Paul never loses sight of the fact that he loves this congregation and that he loves this church. And it is his love that drives him to correct them. But it is also his love that prevents him from being more harsh than he actually was. So it goes both ways. Love is what causes you to correct misbehavior, but it is also what stops you from being a jerk. So may we all learn something here. Not just about legalism and grace, and not just about the importance of showing hospitality, and not just about false teachers and how to restore a congregation and, and so on, but, but also about evangelism, also about how to pastor, also about what to look for in church leadership, and also about the power of love when it comes to evangelism and what love causes us to do and what love causes us to not do. So there's a lot of stuff in this text, and may we learn from it. And may we also follow suit and mimic, and Paul, and mimic Paul's behavior, because this is a really good case study of how we ought to evangelize, not just to large groups of people, but even one-on-one with individuals as well. But I'll close this in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this incredible book of Galatians that you have blessed your church with. We thank you for your humble servant, Paul, and we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that you have worked in him to accomplish the task of this writing. We, it is our prayer, Father, and our petition that you instill within us the knowledge of this book and that this doesn't just translate to our mind, but that this also translates to our behavior. May we learn to love one another and may we learn to love the individuals whom we are evangelizing. And may, Father, we be loving enough to call people to repentance, but may we also be loving enough to be gentle and may we also be loving enough to be kind And Father, may we be able to identify false doctrine and not be led astray by false words and false praise and by flattery and by the seductive words of men or of women. May we instead be able to hold our ground and use the scriptures as our anchor that holds us fast in this world of false doctrine that is constantly trying to lead us astray from you. May we consistently hold firm and hold fast to you. And may you hold fast to us and continue to guide us into truth, continue to sanctify us, continue to build us up, continue to strengthen us, and continue to embolden us. And Father, as we venture into this next session of worship, we ask that you bless our pastor and may you empower him by your spirit to preach your word with boldness and accuracy. And may you empower us as listeners to understand and to comprehend and to focus. We ask that we be empowered today, that we be sustained and that we be nourished. And that, Father, today may we truly and genuinely be fed. We love you and we adore you and bless our worship. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen.